Um, yeah, let, let, let me pray for us, actually. And, and if you guys, uh, you know, during the sermon could be praying for me. I've been having problems the last three days, just getting really dizzy when I'm looking at the screen. I, I've had several days over the last week and a half where I've spent a massive amount of time in front of my computer. And I think my system's like, give me a break. So uh, I was feeling dizzy this morning, even before we logged in. So if you guys could help me with that, but let's just uh, worship the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just lift you up. Thank you, Jesus, that we get to uh, gather together, even if it's on Zoom. Thank you that things are beginning to open up. Lord, uh, would you help us? Uh, yeah, get, just get excited about worshiping together in person here in two weeks at Barnes Park. And Lord, we just continue praying that you would uh, give us access um, uh, to a building, Lord, uh, in the upcoming weeks and months. Lord, uh, we just come before your, your throne today, just worshiping you and just being reminded, Lord, uh, through the book of Mark, Lord, that you, are, that you are king, that you're worth worshiping and celebrating and um, submitting to, Lord. So we just pray that you would be with us, Lord, and we thank you and we love you. We lift up your name. Amen. Amen. River of life, welcome. Um, so I, you know, I asked that question about looking back at your life and, mo and, you know, moments where you were just celebrating, right? And I asked like, when, when, when were you celebrating most? And uh, Jesse, are you running the PowerPoint right now? Yes. Okay. You're going to be running that for me. So when I look back on my life, right, I think that there are a few, few different times that I've, I've celebrated, you know, like times where I've just really, really felt alive. And some of these moments were really insignificant, I would argue, from an eternal perspective, right? Like I've had times, man, like when I was at the Rose Bowl, right, in Pasadena, watching UCLA, uh, you know, win a football game at the very last minute of the game. Uh, again, just insignificant in light of eternity, but it just ministered to my soul in a weird sort of way. And then some moments, um, you know, were a little bit more important in terms of celebration, like, you know, when, when my best friend, Mike, uh, came to faith. I just remember just celebrating and rejoicing in who God was. And then some of these moments in my life, you know, were moments you know, where awesome, awesome things happened. If we can mute ourselves, peeps. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, you know, like when I found out that Molly liked me, right? I think I've shared that story with you guys or, or the day when we got married or the day when Santi and Nina were, were born. Uh, so those, those are important times in life to just really celebrate. And this morning, we're going to be looking, like I said, at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And what we're going to see is that th there's a lot of celebration here, right? And, and as a reminder, uh, Jerusalem is the seat of power to the Jewish people. We, we've heard it mentioned in Mark, not always in a positive light, right? When the uh, scribes are sent from Jerusalem to find out what Jesus is doing, but that's never positive, Um uh, but don't forget also that in the previous chapter, we're told actually what's going to happen in Jerusalem. We're getting near to the end of Jesus' life. So just as a reminder, um, uh, let me read um, uh, chapter 10, verses 32 and on to you. They were on their way to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who followed him were afraid. And again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen. You know, so, so he's going to Jerusalem and they know he's going to die, right? And he's just kind of like leading the way. And, and we know how this thing is going to end. Now, there's no indication of that in, in today's text. Today's text is mostly just joyful and stuff. But, uh, you know, on our end, as a reader, we know exactly where this is going. And I think this week there has been actually a, a theme of celebration. Those of you who joined us uh, for Life Group this week will remember that in the previous passage, uh, Jesus leaves Jericho and there's a large crowd that is gathered around him and he heals Bartimaeus, right? And now he's closer to Jerusalem where he's going to be betrayed. And Bethany, uh, that's in our passage for this morning, is about two miles outside of Jerusalem uh, on the road uh, from Jericho. So let's read the text for this morning. I've invited Carlos uh, to, to, to be our reader. So Carlos, to go ahead and take it away. Uh, Mark 11 verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. 
untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and he will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Amen. Thank you, Carlos, for, for reading for us. Uh, so Jesus and the disciples are coming into Jerusalem with the crowd, most likely during Passover <laughs> week. And we're going to talk more about the importance of the Passover when we look uh, at the Last Supper and, 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 and really uh, also in the, the passages on the cross. But for now, we, what we need to know is that there's actually... Uh, thousands of pilgrims in Jerusalem, a lot of people. In other words, yeah, this is not a normal week. This is uh, one of the most important weeks in the Jewish calendar. And people were coming to the city from all over the place, right? Like the place would have been packed. So to get an idea of what I'm talking about, um, think about um, what, what, what Times Square looks like right, on, on New Year's Eve, right, when people just kind of like back in, or for a little bit closer, what Disneyland looks like during the holidays. A anybody ever been to Disneyland right around Christmas time? You know, when, when they got all the fake snow coming down, you know, uh, at, at night, man, I love that stuff. But the one thing that I don't like about it is that it's just crazy packed, you know, you, you have to wait long lines for everything. Uh, and, I, and what I want to say about this is if, if Jesus wanted to go, um, into Jerusalem unnoticed, he could have done it. He could have just walked in like everybody else, right? But he doesn't, right? He chooses to ride in on this cult. Um, and, you know, in, in other versions, like in, in Matthew and Luke, they say that it's it's a young male donkey, you know, a donkey's cult. And we've been studying Mark's gospel inductively now for like four and a half months. And we know that this brother does not waste words. Um, so the question that we need to ask is, what is the significant of this cult business, right? We're going to jump into that. And I have to warn you, just as a disclaimer for this morning, there's a lot of Old Testament passages. Uh, I do have slides for some of them, but not all of them. And some of them I'm just going to like, boom, put on the screen really quickly, because uh, there's a lot of Old Testament stuff happening in this passage, but we need to go there, because if you don't, we're going to, you know, really miss some of what's going on. So in Numbers 19, Deuteronomy 21, and 1 Samuel 6, we see that the Lord always asks for animals that are without uh, defect, that have not been ridden, and that have never had uh, a yoke put on them, uh, specifically for sacrifice. So when it comes to using animals, right, for religious purposes, what we can say is that God wanted the best, you know? This is like the ancient version of, like, that new car smell. God just kind of, like, wants the best. Um, and the fact that this cult has never been ridden uh, in, in the book of Mark suggests that it's, it's still young. Right. And that th there are religious and messianic implications that are happening in the text. And the main difference in, in the passages that I mentioned right here in, in, in Numbers, Deuteronomy and First Samuel is that in all those cases, it's a young cow that is being mentioned. So now, you know, why a cult? Uh, why like, you know, a donkey? How is this uh, a youthful, you know, to God's plan? Well, in the Old Testament, we have several references to kings and rulers coming on uh, a colt, okay, or, 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 or a donkey. In Genesis 49, if you can get the slide up there, Jesse, uh, Jacob blesses his sons and tells Judah specifically that the scepter will never leave him. In, all, in other words, uh, that, that he is just, his, his ancestors are going to rule, that one day a ruler will come and that the nations are going to obey him, right? So some have interpreted this as a, a messianic passage, that this ruler, uh, and, and it says that this ruler would basically tie this donkey to a vine. And you see that in verses 
uh, 10 and 11. And what Jacob was saying, right, was that, that, that Judah's ancestors would rule and that someday one would come and like get obedience from all the nations. And if, if we fast forward a little bit uh, over to 1 Kings, uh, 1 Kings uh, 1, actually, we see that that Judah that Judah's uh, that that Jacob's blessing to Judah is is somewhat reenacted uh, when Solomon goes to to uh, Gihon and and on David's donkey to be anointed king over Israel. So this is almost like a reenactment of what's happening in the book of Genesis. And the people rejoice and celebrate. Right. So I'll read it to you. So the priest Zadok, the prophet Nathan, uh, and Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, and uh, what is that, Carathites and the Pelophites went down and had Solomon ride on a king, on King David's mule, and led him to Gihon. There the priest Zadok took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet, and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. And all the people went up following him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy, so that the earth quaked at their noise. Right. So there's there's uh, more evidence there of coming in, you know, riding on on a mule, riding on a donkey. But the main passage um, that scholars think that Mark has in mind is probably Zechariah nine, nine through ten. In fact, in Matthew's version, he tells us this is so Mark doesn't. But the similarities are there. So check this out in Zechariah nine, nine through ten. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious is he, humbled and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So th these two disciples go in, in, into the village, they untie the, the colt, and some people are like, yo, like, what are you guys doing? You know, it's, it's kind of like the ancient equivalent of a carjack. And the, the, the <laughs> disciples uh, are just like, hey, you know, the Lord needs it. You know, like the, the Lord needs this thing. Don't worry about it, y'all. We're going to bring back bring it back to you. This, this feels like theft, but really this thing is going to accomplish uh, the, the Lord's purposes. So what special purpose does this cult have in God's plan? And what I want to say is that this is a very special donkey, y'all. This is like... Um, the most special donkey cult in, in the history of the world. Um, part of me feels like, man, somebody should write a poem uh, about this donkey from the perspective of the donkey. Well, what I want to argue, uh, all joking aside, is that um, in asking for this, for this donkey to be brought to him and riding it into the city, Jesus is actually declaring that he is the promised king from the Old Testament. Right, this donkey is going to bring the humble king into Jerusalem, and this king will give peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea, like we see in Zechariah's prophecy. Now, we've seen other promises like this uh, in the book of Mark, especially in that Daniel 7 passage, right? We've been referencing that passage ever since we uh, first saw Jesus refer to himself as the son of man. We've read that passage several times. Uh, do you all remember that? I don't have the slide for it, but let me read it to you, and you'll see some of the, the similarities. Um, he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom, his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So we begin to see some of the themes in the book of Mark kind of uh, coming together here near the end of Jesus' life. Now, up to this point, Jesus' identity has, for the most part, remained a secret, right? The demons know who he is. Uh, the disciples understand that he's the Messiah now. Uh, but this is the first time he declares who he is actually through his actions uh, in, a, in a way that's a little bit more blatant. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on a donkey like one of the kings of old. It's like it's a public declaration, right? Like not with trumpets, but with the humble act. But the implication is the same. I am the king, and I'm entering into the city. Now, I just want you to know that for me personally, man, like I love this, right? Because I, I, I love reading the prophets and their interactions with the kings. Uh, and historically speaking, uh, to be quite honest, the Israelites didn't have the best of luck with kings. 
Um, every single king in the northern kingdom of Israel was bad, and maybe a third of the kings in, in the southern kingdom were good. But for the most part, you know, bad kingship, bad, bad human leaders. And, and if you look back in the Old Testament, a thousand years before this event that we're reading about today, the people actually wanted a human king, right? They had never had a king up to that point. And the reason they give Samuel in 1 Samuel 8 is because, because we, we want a king because we want to be like the other nations, right? And, and, and Samuel warns them, you know, and, and, but, but they're like, no, like, just give us a king. We want to be like everybody else, you know, like they're looking at uh, all these other nations that have their leaders that are leading them into war. And, and they want a human leader that's going to lead them, uh, uh, you know, uh, like that. They're, they're all like, it's awesome. Um, and in asking for a human king, the people actually reject God as king. And that's God's interpretation of the situation. So Samuel warns them of what, what is going to happen. Um, but they refused to listen to him. And for the next 400 years of, of Israel's history, both Israel and Judah have, for the most part, like I said, just bad kings over them. And, uh, but what I love, right, again, about this passage is that God takes their decision to reject him as king uh, and promises to give them a king from the line of David. So you wanted human kings? I'm going to give you human king, uh, but it's going to be my king. You know, so God takes the rebellion and promises that something good is, is going to come out of their bad decision. He sends Jesus to them, his son, to be their king. And then, unlike every other kingdom that came before him, his dominion is one that is never going to end. Somebody say hallelujah. Praise God, right? Like this is actually a very good news in the book, the book of Mark. Now, I want to unpack this king thing for, for a moment. Uh, there's a few things I, uh, I want us to, to understand about kings and kingdoms before we move on. Because uh, most Americans have no idea what a king is because we've never had one before. You know, we, we've had some people that, that thought they were kings and wanted to be, you know, king-like. Uh, but that's just not what we're about. You know, a king is sort of like a president, but not really. Um, for example, nobody votes for a king. You guys ever thought about that? Nobody in, in a true monarchy, right, where, where a king has absolute power, nobody gets to vote for the king. A king becomes king usually because... Uh, he's the son of a king, right? And when his father dies, he kind of come, becomes uh, comes into the throne. Uh, that means that if you're not royal, of the royal uh, family line, you're probably never going to be king uh, unless you decide to overthrow the king, which we see a lot of that in scripture also and throughout human history. But for the most part, you're not voting this person into office. Um, the other thing that I want to say just about kings is the king has absolute power. Right, king had uh, kings in the Old Testament. They had advisors. They had court prophets. Uh, but at the end of the day, they had sole decision-making power. Uh, and again, in an absolute monarchy where where the king has the the final say, what the king says is the law. End of story. Um, so when the king made a decision that impacted everyone in the kingdom, you don't get to decide whether or not you like it. You know, and if and if you don't like it, you better not say that out loud because that's probably not going to uh, be good for you. You just do what the king says, like no questions asked. The only right response to the king is, yes, your majesty. And that's pretty much it. Okay. Now, this type of leadership rubs us the wrong way as Americans, right? Like we don't like to be told what to do. We love our freedom. In fact, our personal freedoms, if you think about it, are a direct reaction to not wanting to have a king. Like that's, that's part of why people came to this continent, right? Because, and, and founded this country because they don't want a king. So we talk about personal freedoms because we kind of want to be our own kings and queens. That, that, that's kind of uh, what we've been programmed uh, as Americans. Like we want, uh, we actually want to say, uh, we want a say on how the government operates. And, and when, when the people that we vote for don't rule the way that we want them to, uh, we have the freedom to talk bad about them on Facebook, if you want, on social media, uh, and at the very least, uh, vote for the next person, you know, uh, four years from now. Now, in a kingdom, you don't get to talk bad about anybody on Facebook. Again, you know, it's not going to be good for you. And there's no voting that king out in the next four years. It's just not going to happen. Now, why am I spending time on this? Why am I spending so much time in talking to us about a king? I'm spending time on this because... The idea 
that God is king is actually one of the primary images of scripture, right? The idea that God is king runs through the entire Bible, and it is actually at the core of Mark's gospel. If you remember back in chapter one, the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, God is king. We talked about it in our study of Mark uh, chapter one, where we said that, uh, that Mark was declaring actually um, that, you know, Caesar might be on the throne, but let me tell you really who's really on the throne, right? And that is God. And the idea that God is king, again, is at the core of the passage uh, that we're reading today. So when we hear that Jesus comes into Jerusalem like a king, uh, part of us gets excited. But what I want to argue is that if we say that he is king, then we have to respond to him like he's the king. And I did have um, a slide about this, Jesse. Yeah. So if we say that Jesus is the king, then we have to respond to him like he's the king, right? When Jesus challenges us, when Jesus asks us uh, to reconcile with somebody or, or apologize, when he calls us to love somebody who's uh, hard to love at work, when Jesus invites us to spend more time with him, when Jesus invites us to tell somebody else about him, our natural response, if we believe that he is king, should be, yes, your majesty. Now, I want you to reflect briefly on the things that Jesus has been challenging, challenging you on lately in the book of Mark. Right? So how has Jesus been challenging you lately, and how have you responded? Right? Is there something that the Lord has called you to do lately that you have not done? And I'm not having you share, share loudly right now. You know, we're going to be talking a little bit more, more about this in breakout rooms. But, but think about it. Has he been challenging you lately in the book of Mark to, to, to respond a certain way? And how, how, have, how have we done it? Now, forgive me if, if it sounds like I've switched it up on you, right? Like I opened up with talking about celebration. And now we're talking about obedience, really. That's what we're talking about. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry. So, sorry for, for, for switching it up on you. But... Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not bringing this up to make, make us feel guilty about what, how we've responded or maybe not responded. I'm just talking about it because I think there are implications to Jesus being king that go beyond just celebrating, right? And I think it's easy to, uh, easier, in my opinion, to celebrate Jesus. And, and it's a whole other thing to say, yes, your majesty. I think that's, that, that's a little bit harder. But uh, I want to argue also that there are implications when we don't say yes to Jesus' challenges, we, we had a student that I met about two years ago that felt called by the Lord to plant a ministry on a campus, okay? And she heard clearly from the Lord that she should do this. I'm not going to get into specifics, but she did everything that she could to not plant that ministry. The Lord gave her scriptures. The Lord gave her visions and dreams. The Lord sent her mentors to do this, okay? We had funding for her. And for five months, uh, this young lady refused to do it. And we couldn't make her do it because that's just not how we roll. You know what I mean? Like she was telling us, God wants me to do this. God wants me to do this. And her dreams and her visions, yo, they were just like, like spot on. You know what I mean? Like she wasn't making this stuff up. So finally one day, you know, I told her staff worker to ask her why she wasn't starting this ministry when she knew she was telling us that God had told her to do it. Um, and this is what, this was her response. She said, when I was young, my parents told me to do things all the time, but there were no con consequences when I refused. They let me do whatever I wanted. So if God tells me to do something, I don't feel like I have to listen because I don't think there are consequences. Man, and she said this and it just like blew my mind. You know what I mean? Like, well, what, what do you say that? Wait up. You're just gonna, you know, yeah. to listen to the Lord because... Uh, you know, your parents gave you no consequences when you didn't listen to them when you were young. And it just blew my mind, man. But what I want to argue is that there are consequences to that. Um, when we refuse to respond to Jesus' invitation, we harden our hearts towards him, right? We miss out on opportunities to grow. We miss out on intimacy with him. We, we miss out on, on relationship with other people. So let me ask you, right? Like, think about this uh, quickly, you know, uh, 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 can you think for just for a moment, in about times in your life when you've grown the most in your life with God, right? Did you grow because you said no to God? Or did you grow because you heard his voice 
and his challenge, and you said yes to him. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that most of us grew when we responded, yes, Lord. Even if it was reluctantly, even if we were scared, we kind of just went with it, and we were blessed by it. And, and, and maybe you didn't, we didn't have the right interpretation in the moment, but years later, we looked at that, man, I'm so glad that I did that. So if the call to obedience right, is difficult or if it seems harsh, I just want to remind us um, that the king we worship is not like other kings. Right? Instead of a, 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 sir, a, a, of a king who takes and takes and takes, like we see in, in the book of uh, 1 Samuel, um, Jesus is one who gives. You know, we, 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 we worship a giving God, you know. We don't follow a harsh dictator. He has all the authority in the universe, and yet he uses his authority for the sake of others. Think about even just what we've seen in the last three chapters of Mark's gospel. Jesus stops for, a, for you know, for blind Bartimaeus, right, in the last passage. What do you want me to do for you? Right? Jesus is the king who came to serve. And not just to be served and, and, and to give his life as a ransom for many, right? In Jesus' kingdom, like we've been looking at this over the last month, month and a half, uh, those who are at the bottom of the totem pole are the greatest. Like, what other king does that, man? You know, what, what are other kingdoms that you've known um, that looks like this? So what I want to argue, river of life, we, we serve a good king, right? We, we follow the best king that there has ever been. So, so let me ask you again, what has Jesus been challenging you in lately? Right? And how have we responded? Is, is there something that the Lord has called you to do lately that you have not done? And, and really, I, I just want to encourage us to be the type of church that says, yes, your majesty, because we acknowledge the Lord is king and we know that he is a good king. Amen? Okay, let me get a drink of water and then we'll move on. Looking at the text and talking about celebrating. Finally get to it. So um, I'm, I'm going to read it from verse 8. And, and Jesse, I think that there might be a slide for this. Um, yeah, so verse 8 says, Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, Hosanna, in the highest heaven. And the people prepare the way, right? More than likely, this is the same crowd that were with him at the end of the last passage. And basically, they followed him all the way uh, from, from Jericho to Jerusalem. And they begin to put their cloaks on the floor. Um, now, again, Mark doesn't waste words, right? We've, been, we've, we've seen this uh, 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 cloaks on the floor thing before in the Old Testament, um, in 2 Kings 9.13, and let me just give you a quick backdrop to this story, to, to this verse. Elisha sent a young prophet to anoint Jehu king over Israel, right, in, in the verses right before verse 13. And this young prophet takes Jehu aside, so he, he goes over to Jehu, and, and he takes him aside uh, from all the other officers. And I think that Jehu at this point is commander of the army, and he pours oil on his head, and he says, this is what the Lord uh, the God of Israel says, I anoint you king over the Lord's people, Israel. And when the officers asked Jehu what had happened, they just begin to rejoice, right? They burst out into celebration and, and they prepared the way for him. And this is, this is the verse that follows. Then hurriedly, they all took their cloaks and spread them for him on the bare steps. And they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. And in Mark's passage, the crowd is basically doing the same thing. Right? They're taking their outer garments and putting them on the floor uh, in front of Jesus. It, it's a way to kind of like just lay out the red carpet for, for a ruler. Like, like they're basically preparing the way for a king. They're saying, we honor you. We prepare the way for you. We celebrate who you are. Um, so this is, this is like a, a royal procession, right? In, in ancient times, kings would come into a city. The crowds would gather and together they would just kind of like go, go to the palace uh, this is actually very common with, with uh, the Romans and the Greeks when they conquered a city. They, they, they would take some of their captives. They would take some of the artifacts that they had stolen and taken from, from the city that they, that they had conquered. And then they would parade them to, through the streets for everybody to see. 
and to celebrate. And it was done uh, also throughout the ancient world when a new king was crowned. And we see some evidence, obviously, in, in scripture. Um, but I think just for us, just for our sake, uh, one, of, one of the best possession, uh, royal possessions in our day comes from a Disney movie. You all know what, what, what Disney movie I'm talking about? Anybody, anybody know what a royal possession in one Disney movie looks like? Anybody? Anybody? Aladdin. Aladdin. Exactly. That's right. So I'm going to show you a clip to give you an idea of what these possessions might look like. Now, obviously, Disney, I'm just going to tell you, Disney just overdoes it, y'all, for the sake of pageantry. Okay? So I'm not, I'm not saying it totally exactly looked like this. But I'm showing you so that you can get a feeling of, of how people are just celebrating and, and what it does, okay? Like what, what, what it does for the person who's coming in. Uh, and, and I'm going to show you the new version with Will Smith, not the one with Robin Williams. Don't hate me. Those of you who are Gen Xers, okay? It's not the original. Uh, but we watched this new one about a month and a half ago uh, with the kids, and it was awesome. And what I want you to do is I want you to pay attention to what's being communicated about Aladdin, or in this case, you know, he's incognito right now. He's Prince Ali. And I just want you to, to take a look at how much these people are celebrating. So let me, let me resume here. Like, what was that like for you guys to watch that? Uh, let's unmute ourselves. What, what, what are you making about processions, kingly processions? Carlos, you were like dancing, bro. I saw you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Good times. I, I think it was a little understated. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's like a Vegas show, AB says. <laughs> so let me see. Let me look at the chat. Oh, man. Yeah, I <laughs> love the Fresh Prince. Yeah, it was, it was a, a lot of fun. I think it, it's well done. And any other comments? Just like, well, what's it like just watching that? You guys are being shy. It's like a whole it's spectacle. It's, yeah, it's you want to be there. Makes you want to be there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that's that's the main thing that I took, right? Like wh when I watched the scene, man, I just want to join in, you know? I want to join in. I want to celebrate. Like Will Smith and Robin Williams in the original, uh, they just do a really good job of giving praise uh, to Aladdin, you know, like making Aladdin looked really awesome. And it makes me want to dance. And, you know, I'm not a dancing guy. So if, if something makes me want to dance, uh, you know, it's good. Um, it makes me want to be there. It makes me want to celebrate. It just like brings joy to my heart. It just looks like a lot of fun, right? And we have to imagine that something similar is happening with the crowd in Mark's gospel, right? Like they're just kind of getting caught up in the moment. They're celebrating Jesus and just honoring him as king. Like it's a good thing. Uh, and, and what's nuts, nuts about the scene is that, that Jesus doesn't tell them to be silent, right? Jesus allows the crowd to honor him. And as a reminder, this is the first time in Mark's gospel that Jesus publicly allows anyone to praise him in this way. We have not seen this, right? We've been studying this book for four and a half months, and that's just not the way that, that, that it's gone. Uh, when the disciples finally talk about Jesus being the, 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 the Messiah, uh, he tells them to not tell anybody, right? And whenever the demons try to reveal his identity, he tells them to be quiet. That's not the case in this passage. Jesus just kind of lets it all happen, right? And they sing for him. They worship him. They praise him. And again, this is a time of, of celebration. And, and, and they shout out, Hosanna, which means literally save us or save us now. Like in, in later years, that phrase uh, went on to mean something more like praise God. But, but originally... It, it means save us. Uh, and, it, and in Psalm 118, uh, where, where this verse come from, come from you're, you're going to see it actually means save us. This psalm was often shouted out when a king would, would defeat his enemies and come back into Jerusalem on the procession towards the temple. And this is what, what, uh, what we see in uh, Psalm uh, 118, uh, save us. Or if I were going to put the parentheses, that would be Hosanna. We beseech you or, or we beg you, O Lord. O Lord, we beg you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. And, and what they're saying is, save us, save us now. Lord, these are shouts of jubilation, right? So in, in Mark's passage, they're directing that sort of praise to Jesus. And they see him coming. They see his coming into Jerusalem as, 
has a promise of victory, right? So, so this crowd at this point does not understand that Jesus' ultimate victory is actually going to be on, on the cross, but we're not going to hold that against them today because they're just worshiping, worshiping him, right? Like they understand that there's something awesome about him, right? They have heard about the things that he has done. He has been actually gathering crowds from the very beginning of Mark's gospel, and they shout, blessed is he, uh, uh, blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, right? So that's in the book of Mark. And, and what basically what they're asking, they're asking God to work on their behalf through Jesus, right? They see him as a savior. Again, they're not thinking that Jesus is coming into Jerusalem to die on a cross. They don't see him as a Messiah in the way that you and I uh, think about Messiah. We've been, you know, we've been trying to ha hammer that point home for like a month now, right? But their emphasis here is not the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of David, which has more political and nationalistic undertones. They don't fully understand what's about to happen, but they worship him. And that's a beautiful thing. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, what does this have to do with us? Like, and what does it have to do with us? What is our second response to the fact that Jesus is king? If our first response was obedience and learning to say, yes, your majesty, and just kind of going for it, I believe that, that uh, if Jesus is king, then we must also worship him. Okay, if we say that Jesus is king, then we must also just worship him and just celebrate him. We have to give him honor. We have to give him praise. And when we talk about worshiping Jesus, I want you to know that I'm not just talking about like musical celebration. I'm talking also about worship with our whole lives, right? Uh, in, in the way that we carry ourselves, giving ourselves over to him fully and having him be at the center of our lives. It has to do with how we live our lives every single day with Jesus in light of everything else that is happening around him. Will we hold on to him? Will we celebrate with him regardless of what the, the world throws at us? Um, and let's be honest, just with ourselves, just, just for a quick minute. Look, the last year of our lives has been ridiculously difficult, right? Most of us have had to put our lives on hold in ways that we never thought we were gonna do. Uh, those of us with kids at home have had to move our schedules around to help them. And at this point, you know, more recent, just to motivate them. You know what I mean? Like my son is just like done with Zoom meetings, right? Now, and, and, but I think for the vast majority of us, until recently, you know, we didn't hang out. We haven't been hanging out with family. Think about last Easter. Think about like uh, barbecues. I, I barbecue Memorial Day, you know, or the 4th of July. That didn't happen. Man, this has been going on for a year, right? We did. And, and, and we tried, like we, 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 we tried, given what we had, given the restrictions we done, you know, we, we did what we could, you know, we, we did the best. You guys remember the ha Halloween drive-by? Parents, some of you remember that? Some of you all participated? That, that was a lot of fun, you know, but it wasn't trick-or-treating, you know. Um, it just wasn't the same, you know. Thanksgiving wasn't the same. Christmas was not the same. Man, uh, all of us have had a birthday celebration now since the pandemic began and celebrating has just looked different you know like like we do drive-bys you know and, and when I grew up drive-by had you know a different connotation now everybody does drive-bys and, and and celebrates this is really weird um so things have been just really hard we everything has been on hold and and seriously we're just tired of wearing masks right um but let me say something in the midst of this crazy year, I just want to acknowledge that Jesus is still king. Jesus is still king. And as bad as it's been, Jesus is still worth praising. And I don't want to pretend uh, to know everything, all the difficulties that you all have been through. But I do know that when you learn to worship Jesus and be with Jesus and walk with Jesus and fall in love with Jesus and celebrate Jesus, we can learn to have hope and love life even in the midst of one of the worst years in the last hundred years. I, I have no doubt in my mind that if Jesus is at the center and we're walking with him, we're praising him, we're just living life with him, that, that, you know, that things could look different for us. And, and one of the people that uh, in, in ROL that has worshiped Jesus and held on to him tightly this year is my sister, Nancy. Nancy, I'm gonna talk about you, Nancy. Now, most of us were not very close to Nancy when we were at our old church. Uh, but let me tell you, uh, man, this last year has been difficult for our sister Nancy, right? She's had a little bit of family drama, 
some health issues. And, and like many of us, she's been lonely. I'm not going to get into the, the specifics of how, how difficult it's been because it's not my story to tell, but I'm going to tell you how she's responded to it. Right. And, and I see you, Nancy. Okay. I, I see you. I want to honor you right now. And, and, and the thing that, that I've appreciated most about Nancy is that in the midst of a very rough year, she went all in in worshiping Jesus. This woman inspires me, man. I'm like just so proud of her. Nancy has held on to the Lord and just loved him. Nancy started coming to, to our morning prayers at 6.30 in the morning. I don't know how many months ago, man. She's just been at it almost from the beginning. And, and at one point, she just started leading us in devotional also. So if you're around a Tuesday morning at 6.30 in the morning, Nancy leads us in, in devotional. Right? She's not just uh, receiving, she's participated in the leading. And, and the only time she doesn't make it is, is when her body won't allow her to do it. You know, just, just keeping it real. Nancy has been studying scripture inductly, inductively with us when we started in Ephesians last fall. And she's been with us every week in life group as we studied the book of Mark. Nancy is shameless. Let me tell you about telling people about Jesus and about river of life. In fact, yesterday I called her up uh, to pray, to pray with her and ask her if I could share her story. And she has a friend over um, at her, at her place. And she talks to me for about two or three minutes. And she says, okay, now, now, now you got to pray for my friend. I, and she has the phone to her friend. I'm like, who is this? Like, wait up, wait up. Who are you? Like, are you okay with me praying? <laughs> are you okay with me praying for you? You know, uh, but she doesn't care. You know, um, pray for my friend, Pastor Abner. And, and friend, this is Pastor Abner. He's going to pray for you. You know, shameless. And it's just, it's just been beautiful to see. And if you're ever around at 630, like I said, for devotionals, and you get an opportunity to hear Nancy pray, it's just beautiful. You can tell that in the last year, she has learned to appreciate all of who Jesus is and, and what he has done in her life. When Nancy prays, I feel like she's just worshiping Jesus. You know, like when, when she prays, I feel like, like that scene from, from Aladdin. Boom, let's just like worship Jesus. Yeah, life has been hard. Really hard for our sister. But man, she's celebrating the Lord. Brothers and sisters, let's do everything that we can to get closer to Jesus and worship with him with our, with our whole lives. Um, there's another person that I'm really proud of. Um, I'm not going to share the whole story because, because he's, he's going to tell us about it. But uh, another person that I've been just really proud of in the last few weeks has been Sam, Sam Yao. And Sam, I see you, brother. Wave, wave hi to everybody. Uh, Sam and I started meeting in January for mentoring and prayer. And he told me that he really just wanted to learn how to hear Jesus' voice. So we talked for several weeks about things that bring him closer to God. And I would ask him about that. Uh, we looked at different ways that God speaks. And more recently, we've been reading a book together on hearing God's voice. And last week when we met, uh, Sam starts reading me, reading to me some of, some of his, his journal entries and some of the things that God has been saying to him in prayer. I was just blown away, y'all. You know, I was just like so blown away. I was like, what's, what happened to you, Sam? You know, this is not where you were at spiritually in January. And Janelle, I always tell him, you need to tell Janelle. You need to tell Janelle. So I'm hoping he's telling you, you know, like what the Lord is doing in his life. Uh, Sam has been getting close to Jesus. He's been learning to hold on to him, to worship him, to do everything that he can to get more of the Lord. And Sam, like I said, is going to share that testimony um, in a few weeks. So I won't steal all his thunder, but I just want to prepare you for that, right? This brother, he's kind of been, been going for it. So Nancy and Sam's stories are examples of how individuals in our church are learning just the words of Jesus, to celebrate, to walk with him in the middle of this crazy year. And I don't know where you're all at in your relationship with the Lord, um, but my question is, are you going all in? Are you going all in like that, right? Are you giving him your best? Are you giving him that kind of worship? And this week in Mark has been all about going all in for Jesus and worshiping him and praising him and not caring what anybody else says, right? And I think we just need to learn as a church to be like the crowd. Hosanna, Lord, save us. 
save us, Lord. We beg you, Lord. Let us walk with you, Lord. Let us just kind of go there with me. I'm going to, I'm preaching now, y'all. I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I'm excited about this. I'm going to knock something over here. I'm going to knock my water over. You know, we, we need to be like the crowd. We need to be like, like Bartimaeus. Jesus, son of David, have, have mercy on me. You know, like the crowd's like, be quiet, you blind beggar. You know, like, like be quiet. He didn't care, man. He didn't care what, what they thought. He just kind of kept at it. You know, in fact, that just gave him reason to, to be more crazy about it, right? Even louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus heals him. And Bartimaeus joins the crowd and follows Jesus. In fact, Bartimaeus, I don't know if you guys have thought about this, is probably part of this procession. He's most likely one of the people that have joined the crowd and is saying, leading the way and saying, Hosanna, save us, Lord, to worshiping Jesus. In closing, River of Life, what type of church do we want to be? Right? When people visit River of Life and interact with us, I want them to know that we're a church that lifts Jesus up and acknowledges him as king. Right? I want people to say that those people from ROL know how to say yes to the king. Those people know how to say yes, your majesty. Those people in ROL worship Jesus in every area of their lives, and they're completely shameless about it. They're just going to lift the name of Jesus up. That's what I want us to be. So where are we at? Can each of us say without the shadow of a doubt that we're doing all that we can to get closer to Jesus and worship him with our whole lives? Let me give you a few seconds to reflect on that before I send this, send this into small groups. And as you can tell, my voice is beginning to, to fail me here. Where, where, where are you at? Yeah, I'm just going to... Again, give you a few seconds, reflect on it. Where are you at? Are you all in on worshiping Jesus this way? Okay. Um, Jesse, if you can put the final slide up. We've talked about obedience. We've talked about worshiping, celebrating Jesus. These are your two questions in breakout groups. What has Jesus been challenging you lately in the book of Mark? And how have you responded? And how do you need to grow in worshiping Jesus with your whole life? Okay, I'm going to give you about 10 minutes. You know, share whatever's on your heart. And if you're able to, share vulnerably. Amen? All right, if you could um, stop sharing, Jesse. I'm going to send us all out into breakout rooms. I'm going to give you just a, a little bit, a little bit longer. Give me a sec. I hid this thing. Here we go. Come back together. Just go ahead. Um, let's just go ahead and unmute, unmute ourselves, everybody. Just at the same time, whatever the Lord puts on your heart. Uh, not not one person at a time. Everybody at the same time. Let's unmute ourselves and let's just give our praise to the Lord, to the King of Kings. Amen. Let's go for it. Heavenly Father, thank you for the many continued blessings that you uh, just uh, bestow and lay down upon us. We are so thankful for all the things you've given us, the community you've given us, the church you've given us. Ask that you give us the ability to listen, the ability to hear your call and reach out to us, that we're able to hear those things and respond to you. You know that sometimes you call us and you ask us to do 
thank you about difficult things, but as if you give us the ability to face those things and answer to your will and just continue to give you your example and communities to those who to see you to those who just everyone in the world will be to just answer your call and give your will and that we will continue to worship and praise you all the days of our life. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Lord, we just uh, acknowledge you as King, Lord. We worship you. We lift up your name. God, we just, um, we, we want to learn how to say, yes, your majesty, Lord. Would you give us those types of heart that just respond, Lord God, to whatever you tell us to do. I know that that's hard sometimes. And I know that that's scary, Lord, but we also acknowledge that the times that we say yes to you are the times where we just grow the most, Lord. So would you give us courage, Lord God? Would you give us that, that type of um, just devotion to you, Lord, that we acknowledge you as king and say, yes, your majesty, we will do whatever you asked us to do. And Lord, we know that, uh, yeah, in the midst of this rough year, uh, that you still... Uh, uh, you're still king. You're still seated on the throne, Lord. And I don't, I don't say that to diminish uh, some of the sufferings that we've experienced, Lord, but I just want to lift you up above those things. And I just pray that we would turn to you, Lord God, that we would celebrate all of who you are, Lord, and God, that you would teach us how to, how to go all in for you, Lord. Thank you um, for this passage this morning for remind us, reminding us that you're the king. And Lord, we just, we just praise you. We worship you, Lord. God, we acknowledge that you are the one who saves. God, I just pray that we would all yell out, Hosanna, Hosanna, Lord God, and just be reminded, Lord God, that ultimately uh, you are the one who saves us, Lord. You are the mm -hmm. one who we worship, Lord. We thank you. We pray these things all in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen, Amen, Amen. church family. I hope that was good for your hearts. Um, I don't know how to transition this into... <laughs> Uh, announcements, but we need to do that at some point just because it's time. But thank you so much for staying engaged this morning. Yeah, thank you for staying on for a little bit longer. Um, just a reminder again, we are um, continuing our our study in, in Mark and studying, seeing the king as he's um, preparing for um, yeah, preparing for the cross, Lord. Um, so we just, uh, just continue. And even if you haven't joined like in a while, we just these are these are still open groups. Um, you can come in and um, and uh, yeah, dive into God's word and um, you know. And we talk a lot about uh, all of these things is really just uh, falling in love with Jesus again. Um, so we just encourage you to do that. Um, May is API um, Heritage Month, and as we had talked about um, last week, uh, there's a, a, a Christian artist, uh, Anson Liu, that uh, Amy's going to be kind of spearheading. Uh, a um on saturday on the, the 29th we would uh, a group of us anyone who's interested be able to go and, and see the the art show um that is focused on the asian american experience and so you can rsvp to amy um there's her uh email address and as we had um talked about last week we are celebrating our one year anniversary so here's something to celebrate celebrating uh what god has done in our midst on Sunday, May 30th. Um, I've sent the online form to everyone who's on the email list. So hopefully you already received it and already filled it out. If not, I'm gonna have, uh, I think Abner just post it in the chat um, so that you could do that right now. Again, if you're, um, don't just do it for yourself. If there's other people um, in your family group, then we ask that you fill it out for every individual person. Um, just also know, like, the question about the vaccination is not, you know, we're not saying that if you're not vaccinated, you can't come, but there are more um, guidelines about, um, you know, just like they have at Dodger Stadium and any other events, like, there's actually, uh, you're, if you are vaccinated, then that would also help us plan, like, how we um, seat people and, and group people. Um, so it's not whether or not, like, you can only come if you're vaccinated, but we just want to be able to know so that if we do if we do know then there there could be different ways that we configure the space um, at Barnes Park. Um, I'm also trying to think yeah so we'll be giving more uh, information about the about that service as we get closer to the date we're working on it um, behind the scenes 
Um, just also for me personally, if there's anyone who wants to um, uh, help with some of the ushering and kind of like interface with the community as they're walking by, uh, please let me know. I think I'm looking for at least um, three or four people. Um, I'm going to have uh, Molly talk a little bit more about our public Facebook page, but I, I personally enjoy just reading all the, the stories from, from the moms from all different kind of backgrounds uh, this week um, through our, our River of Life Monterey Park, our public Facebook page. So I'm going to have Molly share about that. Awesome. Yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out to all the folks that wrote something. So we had one each day, which was really special. So uh, we had Aaron, Amy, Maria, Janelle, Jesse, Talene, and Armani. So thank you guys so much. Um, let me see if I can. Okay. But if you go on that public Facebook page, you can just, there's a picture of each of them and there's a story. And like Jesse said, each one is um, a little bit different depending on their story of being uh, a mother, what that's looked like, or Jesse writes about his mother um, uh, as an immigrant and what that looked like for her. So Anyways, go ahead and check those out if you haven't got a chance to. And just, I think social media is a way we can get the word out. So even if we're going to be posting sermons on the public Facebook page as well. So if there's one at some point that really stirs you and you want to share that on your, your personal first Facebook page, you can do that and allow people to get more connected to our church. So thank you guys for contributing and continue to be blessed through the, to the um, pieces that people wrote on Mother's Day the, the last week. And um, I have one other announcement I wanted to make. We don't have a slide for this, but um, this is actually related to Jeff and Ashley. So they are going to be moving. They're moving from an apartment to their house that they've been renting out in Upland. And I wanted to share, have them share briefly. I was going to ask them, Jeff and Ashley, can you just do like maybe a one minute? Um, like, why is this move significant for you guys? What's, what's significant about it? Hi everybody, um, just wanna you know celebrate Jesus in this um, and just praise praise God for um, you know what He's doing in our life and you know we're we're entering a season of transition where we are moving um, as Molly mentioned and just thank you um, ROL for um, just so many ways that God's used um, each and every one of you um, and we wanted to just share that um, that in this season yeah we are. Um, entering into a new, uh, new season of new life. And, um, you know, and, and when I got sick about four years ago, it was really um, just kind of our whole life in all areas got affected, including um, potentially losing our house as well as financially. Um, and I ended up also losing my job. So um, it's not so much the house itself as we're moving back, but it's actually we're moving back with a different mindset and um, God's really helped us simplify our life and um, really worked. We've been working inward um, during this season. And, um, you know, as we're moving back, we still have um, some things to process in Upland. There's um, a lot of, um, you know, things associated with death, illness, um, depression, despair. Um, separation. And, yeah, <clears throat> separation and separation from God, separation in our marriage, and um, also just separation as a mom. Um, personally, for me, just not being able to be the mom that, um, you know, and largely being able to take care of Darren, so. Yeah, and I think both of us were kind of unsettled um, moving back initially and, you know, we we're having a lot of thoughts, you know, for me, I, I wasn't sure what was causing my anxiety and I think unconsciously it was just a lot of, you know, un unfinished things or maybe even bad memories um, from then. And, you know, we were just like, oh, should we just try to sell our house and, and you know, go somewhere else and in a sense, maybe running away from those things and uh, with the crazy, you know, housing market and all that, I think God's kind of in a way, pushing us towards going back and in some ways, you know, healing that area of our life instead of running away from it. And, um, but, you know, and the anxiety of kind of like, oh no, will things go back to the way they were, but, you know, he's giving us a fresh start, a second chance and, um, you know, coming in, you know, like Ashley said with a, a, you know, new mindset and a new foundation. And also we haven't, uh, we're also healing from separating from our um, codependencies in our, our marriage. And um, this is kind of helping us to um, 
allow us a space where we can um, continue to work on our marriage as um, under one roof with Jeff, me and Darren, um, where I'm also able to have my infusions, which um, praise God now they're every eight weeks instead of every six or every month before. Um, so I'll, I'll be having those at my house and um, just wanted to share this um, life update with you. So yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, thanks guys for sharing. Really appreciate that. Yeah, we're celebrating with you. So this house is more than just a house. In a lot of ways, it like represents a lot of the pain of the last years, but now God has done so much in Ashley and Jeff in restoring, working on their marriage, working on their own relationship with Jesus and Darren and Ashley's health being so much better. So going back is sort of like, okay, now they're coming from a place of more victory of what God's doing. And we want to bless them in that. So I asked them how we can serve them in this time and the move and all the emotions related to that. And um, they said next uh, Saturday, if anybody is available and would be able to help with some moving, that would be a big blessing. So um, for those of you that would be interested, we're going to meet at Jeff and Ashley's apartment. You can contact me if you're interested so I can get you their address and everything, but meet at their apartment at 10, 10 a.m. next Saturday. Um, and then we'll start taking loads from that apartment over to their Upland house and help them in that way. And then once we arrive there, we put things and get things settled. We're going to have a time of worship and prayer over the house, just declaring God's promises um, over the house and even just cleansing from some of the painful things. And then we're going to have a time just to eat um, and, and order food and have food together. So kind of 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And you can come in to whatever part of that you would want to, depending on your schedule that day. you don't have to be there the whole thing. And then Tammy Chang is going to order the lunch for us and organize that. So if you are interested, we would love to get RSVP so we know how many people to anticipate. Kids are welcome too, but we just want you to wear masks if you're coming. Make sure you wear masks and um, yeah, and we'll order food and it will just be a time of fellowship and blessing them and celebrating um, as God's entering them back into healing in this new season. So yeah, thanks so much. So contact me if you are able to join in. Thanks, Jeff and Ashley. Thanks so much. Thank we you. love you all. Yeah. Any last announcements, Jesse? Yes, sorry, I had to... Um... Wait, what am I doing? Oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so if that's one way you can give, um, that would be really great. There are some other things that are coming up um, uh, for this month and for next month too, so we'll let you know. Um, and just continue, uh, if you're able to financially give, um, we appreciate those who have been doing that faithfully, whether through checks or through Zelle or through our website. And then finally, um, again, our communal devotional times, especially Tuesdays when Nancy's leading um, at 6.30. <laughs> Don't make her nervous, though. No. And then uh, our pre-service prayers at 7.30. And then after service, we will also stay on um, for anyone or anyone who wants to pray for other people can also stay on um, after service, which is happening right now. So go ahead and un uh, unmute yourself. And... Okay. Um, you can wave goodbye if you're not staying. Um, otherwise, you can stay on if you Bye. want to pray. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.